here at the World Cup Friday, November 25th, England versus the USA and Canada. You know, World Cup fever, it's not just in the stadiums where the games are being played. They're in the market squares. They're at the soft where Mexico is rooting this team on. It is, um, let me tell you, Europeans, people across the world, have a great enthusiasm for world soccer, unlike anything I've ever seen. More enthusiastic, more enthusiasm than what we have for professional football, any sports, basketball and baseball. I mean, they take it to a whole different level. Unbelievable, right? This is the Saudis getting ready for their game and they packed into the venue here at the Waldorf Astoria. This is how it looked from um, what you call the drone level. Man, is this not spectacular? Breathe the room only. This tells you how big World Cup is in the world. You know, um, it is um, Saturday, December 4th, and at 10, the United States will be playing the Netherlands today to see what our fate is in the round of 16. You know, I was so honored to be a part of the United States delegation to the World Cup in Qatar. What a spectacular event. You know, Sam Fattis, you are a, uh, soccer is a part of your DNA with you and your kids. I guess I never realized what an impact and what soccer meant to so many undeveloped countries. They have such an identity with it, man. It's serious. Yeah, uh, it, it, it it makes the Super Bowl pale in comparison, right? When the World Cup's going on, the world shuts down. Wherever you are, every little cafe, everybody's everybody's watching. And, and, and it really is the world's game. I mean, you travel all over the world, and if there's an empty lot, even in the poorest neighborhood, there's some kids out there with a ball, and they've set up a pitch, and, you know, they're playing. Uh, fantastic sport. I played. I won't pretend to have been any good. But I also coached, and I enjoyed that, and hopefully was a little better at that. You know, I think what sometimes we lose sight of is that the World Cup decision to go to Qatar, a Qatar, was made on the watch of Bill Clinton. It seemed like ages ago. How is it that a small country, up until the 70s, undeveloped third world country, I mean, the world's safest country, how was it able to bring the World Cup to Qatar, the first in the Arab world, and the last we'll probably see for another 30 or 40 years? Yeah, well, it says a lot for them for their strategic thinking, right, and their foresight, because they've got big plans. They're obviously developing very quickly, and they saw a long time ago what this would, would mean to them. I mean, you're talking about being there. The world is there, and the eyes of the world are on it. There is, there is, uh, I'm a big fan of all kinds of sports, but let's be real. There, there is no sport on the planet that has the pull that soccer does. And, 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 and this operative... I know we're talking about issues other than, other than intelligence. I mean, it's such a skill set. When I saw some of those athletes use their head to bounce the ball into the net, I mean, what athleticism, what skill, what genius. That's something that you see with kids that started playing soccer when they were in the single digits of their age, and they play it all the time. Like Sam said, any of the remote areas of the world that I worked in and in countries all over, whether it's Asia or Latin America, South America, kids are playing soccer. And when we would show up there to do something in a remote area, you took like a case of soccer balls with you because you could always get the kids focused on stuff like that. And then you end up learning and, and meeting a lot of young kids around where you're, wherever you're working in the remote part of the country. It's a universally accepted neutral thing. Everybody likes soccer overseas. Uh, it is certainly a healing sport. You know, Sam, you had the most fascinating article in A&D Magazine on China and Iran. Talk about it. I'm sorry, say again? Your, I, your article, your latest article in A&D on China and Iran. Well, I think you're talking about, we're talking about the disturbances in in, in, in China and, and the, the chaos. And what we're looking at is is what may be a, a, a revolution uh, ongoing in China. And we are kind of seeing the same thing in Iran. Uh, what I wish we were seeing from this administration is somebody paying attention to either 
not just paying attention to these things. That's the wrong emphasis. What I wish is that we saw the United States of America, which is supposed to be the shining city on the hill, the beacon of light, stands for liberty, democracy, and freedom. I wish we saw us standing up for those principles and coming down cleanly on the side of the people who are fighting for the right things in both places. But you know, the Chinese just signaled literally on Thursday that they may compromise with the protesters on COVID. Uh, should we take that seriously? Or is it propaganda? No, look, I, first of all, we should understand that from the Chinese government perspective here, this is not really about COVID, right? This is about, same as we saw would-be autocrats in this country using COVID as an excuse to stomp all over people's personal rights. We are seeing Xi Jinping use COVID as an excuse to crush the power of of people and organizations and influences in this country that he regards as a threat to the Communist Party. Too many people making too much money, getting too close to the West, threatens the old way, the old guard of the Communist Party. So we're gonna lock them down, crush them, that's why they don't care if it hurts business or it hurts productivity, because that's not the point. The point is to 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 crush the opposition. But what he's what he's seeing now is that people are not just meekly sneaking away into the corners and shutting up. They're fighting back. Now, let's be real. This is still communist China, and they are capable of massive brutality. So. Maybe there are people behind the scenes next to Xi saying, you need to lighten up, buddy. You need to compromise. Maybe we're about to see something really bloody and really, really ugly. We're kind of dancing along the knife's edge on that. Uh, Mr. Um, Key's uh, operative, um, you know, China's COVID protesters have become targets of Beijing's surveillance state. Police are using data from mobile phones to track down people who participated in nationwide demonstrations against Z's pandemic controls. American companies like Apple has stopped people from using its airdrop feature, shocking many in the West since we in the West believe in this freedom. What does this say about Xi Jinping and what does it say about our country? Armstrong, it says loud and clear that a communist totalitarian system under Z. They will crush their own population if they think it is at a point where it could destabilize their hold on power. And they'll deliver it with a blow that will horrify the free world and horrify pretty much anybody because there's no limit to what they will do to save themselves. We should be speaking out. There's so much influence that we have by just as assuming the moral authority, which is difficult for us now because we've done so many recklessly irresponsible things overseas recently in the last few years, especially since 9-11. But it, you, you have to say something. When you're killing people because they won't wear a mask, whatever the, the current flavor of the month is for excuses, it has an impact because it's, it's visible. And social media has made the internal activities visible in spite of the regime's effort to silence it. And in Iran, it's tenfold, because the Iranian regime, I think, is in far more precarious a situation than China is right now, because China has the ability and will to, to block so much information out, but it's bleeding out of Iran. And the, the connections to, to Iraq afford them an opportunity to get on the air when they're still inside their own country and broadcast videos and get the message out to the outside world. And there's no sign of anything fizzling out. In the past, a lot of us have waited to see if it would fizzle out inside Iran and the regime was able to extract enough terror or deliver enough terror that it would back, they would back off. But I don't think they're, I don't see signs that that's happening now. And believe it or not, I think one of the central reasons is that Qasem Soleimani is dead. You know, um, his ability to, to suppress that and keep order was unmatched, and he hasn't been replaced by an effective guy. And won't be replaced. You know, Sam, I found it quite fascinating that after three years of COVID, um, President Biden's um, first um, state dinner will be with French President Macron. 
obviously those relationships have, have been frayed. Those relationships have been in tattered. And obviously this is a sign that Biden is trying to heal the wounds between himself and one of America's greatest allies. Yeah, well, as, as John indicated, we have done more damage to American foreign policy and national security in two years than, than anybody could possibly imagine. This administration has made Jimmy Carter's administration look spectacularly competent. So every re key relationship we've got in the world is in tatters. They're desperately trying to fix things on a lot of fronts. So what are they it's trying to fix with the, French, with the French and how important is this state dinner? Well, it's very important. Look, you know, people joke about the French and how reliable they are as allies. But look, this is this is maybe the oldest alliance we've got, right? I mean, they, in the American Revolution, who were the guys who showed up on our shores and actually fought side by side with the Continental Army to free the colonies? Those were French troops, right? Not just volunteers, but a formal alliance. When Pershing went to take the American army in World War I to France, what did he do? He went to the tomb of Lafayette and said, Lafayette, we are here. That was a clear statement of we're here to pay our debt to you guys. So all kidding about the French aside, this is a very old, very key relationship. And given that, when you manage to damage it, when you manage to really put it in tatters, you're doing a whole bunch of things wrong. Um, Mr. Keyes, you've already seen the signs. Uh, now it is a fact that the House will be controlled by Republicans. How much will this imp impact foreign policy and where will it can and will it have the greatest uh, impact given the fact that Kevin McCarthy and the Republicans have made it clear the days of um, sending all that money where billions are unaccounted for to Ukraine are over? I, I, it remains to be seen from my optic. I don't think that McCarthy is the right guy for speaker. And there's so much talk, but the Republican establishment has done so little for so long and let things go and drift. And we are in this situation because of both parties. You can't blame it all on the Democrats. The, the Republican leadership has failed the United States. They failed conservative people in the country and they failed the whole nation and they talk a good game but i haven't seen anything we don't need hearings for the next two years we need action we need substantive action and mccarthy i, I haven't seen anything to instill confidence in me that he's got the ability to do what is required they need to stop the trajectory of what we're doing and where we're headed because we are headed into the abyss as a nation and if they, they don't step up and do things and not just talk about things, the soundbite, we're just going to continue to pick up speed towards the abyss. So, Sam, the House, now that it will control all the committees, control the legislative agenda, should they not pursue Hunter Biden investigation? No, 100 percent they should pursue it, and they should pursue it aggressively. And the Hunter Biden case, you know, is not really about ultimately about corruption. I mean, clearly it is, but that's not the real point. The point is you're talking about contacts between the Biden family that includes Joe and the Chinese Communist Party and Chinese intelligence, first and foremost, before we get to Ukrainians, Russians, every other uh, force on the planet. I mean, we're talking about a, an intelligence operation. We're talking about a threat to national security. We're talking about the compromise of the Oval Office. It's about as dire a threat as you could possibly imagine. Should they pursue that? 100%. But I agree absolutely with my old friend, John. Uh, enough talk, guys, if you in the Republican Party, if you are really the opposition to the Democrats and this radical agenda, then roll up your sleeves and start doing something. Stop mouthing platitudes. Let's put some points on the board and let's actually fight. Uh, we're gonna, um, um, John, we're gonna give you your last word. We're gonna come back with Sam. Sam, remember, we're coming back to you, okay? Don't disconnect. I okay. won't run away. Don't run away. You have a history. John, your final thoughts on something that we have not covered today. I just, the, when you look around the world, there, there are, there's ample indications that the chaos and the disorder and turbulence that is permeating 
more and more countries is a there is a direct correlation to a lack of moral leadership from the West. The West is disconnected from many things. It's hard to read us from other countries. That's one of the complaints I hear overseas. As an example, when you were mentioning about the World Cup, the Middle East, Gulf countries in particular, they have forecasted plans on paper for 2040. They plan way over the horizon, and they put together teams that execute, and they've got their financial resources to deliver. We, I wonder how far out in advance we even look anymore in the United States, much less have a plan. We're not heading off any problems. It seems like every problem hits the desk at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Nothing is avoided. Everything lands there. And at certain points, every administration, and Carter was the last one that was really victimized by this, you lose your ability to manage crisis when your decision-making matrix is completely overloaded. And then you're just responding and trying to put out small fires because you don't have time to think and reflect, and you have no over-the-horizon strategy to avoid problems from reaching the point where they're shooting. And it seems like now everything boils over. Every pot is boiling over quickly, and we're just watching from afar. Well, listen, it's always a pleasure to have you on. When we return, Joshua Shin, Ed Martin, and Sam Faddis will continue the conversation, bringing it back to the domestic front. I'm Armstrong Williams. We'll be back. So Joshua Shin, I see the um, smile on your face. You, um, do you think the president was caught off guard, devastated, honored that Kanye West, after the president announced that he was running, that the, Kanye West asked the president to join his ticket? I think that he was shocked that um, someone had as big as balls as he did, right? I don't think any reasonable person who had asked Trump, who has already been president once and is known to have an enormous ego, to come out and just ask him to be number two. That was shocking, and I think that's also a great reason for him to um, divorce himself from that relationship, especially with the white nationalist connections that West has been um, accumulating lately. Let me ask you, what is Kanye West doing with Nick Fuentes as his campaign manager, who's a devout anti-Semite? I mean, and... I mean, it was just bizarre all around. His antics, um, well, there is, there is a, um, the, black, the, back, uh, the black Hebrew Israelites, um, there is a movement of and relationship with Jews and blacks that does exist. So that may be connected to that, but it's really hard to keep track of what Wes is doing right now. He also bailed on, it, on a very um, notable po- podcast what? appearance with Tim Pool. And I don't know where he's turning. So I think he's turning to what, who, who will listen to him, which right now is the people that most people ignore. Well, let me turn to um, my very good friend, Ed Martin, Here we go, Ed. who seems to always can find the answer. What was Trump thinking? Or was he not thinking at all? Or was he just desperate? No, no, no. He wasn't thinking at all, Armstrong. Look, I, I, what I don't uh, uh, have much understanding for is how people think Trump's going to act different after 50 years of doing this. He, he lives in not a country club. He doesn't live at a golf course. He lives in a dining club. He, he, he loves the idea of people coming by to see him. As you and I mentioned recently, uh, uh, Armstrong, he's also been president now. There's nobody that's normal after they're president, right? They've been told they're great so long. It's, it's, it's distorting. It makes you off balance. So he took a meeting with Kanye. He probably thought it was uh, Kanye, you know, who's been uh, friendly to him in the past. Look, in the last 24 hours, Milo, one of the other attendees, has admitted that he, he did the heat. Now, he may be lying, but he said he set this up in order to give Trump uh, real heartburn. 
He used a worse word than that. But I don't think Trump pays attention. I don't think he cares who he meets with. I think the only thing that I think is hard for uh, the, the voters and the people out there is how the media takes it. And then Trump doesn't like to apologize, as we know. You know, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene was asked about her speaking at a Fuentes event, and she just condemned all of the ideology and all of the conduct and all the speech. That's a little cleaner than what Donald Trump does. But he doesn't care. He doesn't pay attention. He's not a normal political person, not a normal candidate, not a normal president. And some people really like that. Let me go to um, Sam Faddis. Um, when, you, when you think about the big picture, the Republicans control the House. They control the committees. Um, Kevin McCarthy will be speaker, but he will pay a certain price for it in order to get the number of Republicans on board to support his uh, bid. Um, how relevant is Donald Trump now, Sam? And what problems, if any, uh, does Trump create now that he's running for president again? Or, or do you see this as an asset to the party? Well, I think Donald Trump is incredibly relevant to the party because whether you want to call it MAGA or the Patriot Movement or the America First Movement, whatever verbiage you want to use, the base of the Republican Party is now that movement. And maybe America First is the most succinct way to describe it in terms of actual policy. And the standard bearer for that remains Donald Trump. There is, of course, this issue that's percolating already about the, the question of whether DeSantis or Trump should really be the guy that politically should be taking the lead on this. I, increasingly, what I hear at the base is folks do not want to see a fight between them. They don't like negative comments Trump makes about DeSantis. And they are very conscious that DeSantis has been successful in office in a way that maybe you would say Trump is not. But Trump, Trump was not. But Trump remains incredibly relevant as, as that symbol of to the base of we we symbol to the base of policies they want and that they don't necessarily see the establishment championing. So Joshua, um, if you believe the mainstream media, they want you to believe the narrative that the Republican Party is in disarray, but I don't think that could be further from the truth. I agree, and I think that Georgia has laid out the, um, the plan that Republicans need to follow to succeed. You have a governor that has uh, a number of policy successes under his belt. You had a secretary of state who rejected Trump's claims that the election was stolen in Georgia. And you'll see in that race that uh, a lot of the Georgia races were a sweep for Republicans. I think that people are worried that uh, the House majority is much smaller than we expected in the uh, supposed red wave. We have the same uh, majority right now for Republicans as the Democrats had in the last Congress. So there will be some politicking involved, but I think that the voters have made it very clear what they want moving forward. Uh, there, was someone, there was a guest in the last segment, the CIA operative, who noted that people are not really interested in an investigation. They want solutions. They want uh, Republicans to deliver on inflation, on crime, and on immigration. So if they follow those, those plans and um, handle the Trump situation deftly, I think that they'll be, uh, they have a good... Um, forecast going forward. Um, Ed Martin, um, is Herschel Walker in trouble? Well, I mean, is he in trouble? I, it's hard to re read the tea leaves in, in Georgia. You know, I think, as I think you may have told me, he, he finally was ahead by a point or two in some polling. Um, he, he has not been a great candidate in terms of the energy, that has to be said. So I do think that what people may not be um, 
quite catching on to is that uh, Governor Kemp ran a very good race in Georgia. He is lending his get out the vote machine uh, to Herschel Walker's campaign. Mitch McConnell, who I disagree with on policy and some of his decisions, is investing in uh, in Georgia big time. So I, I think we may be surprised that he comes through that. And, and frankly, the Democrats don't need uh, to win that seat to still have control there. They're moving on with their agenda and they will continue to it might make it a little easier to have one more. But um, but I think just if I may, uh, Armstrong, comment on the previous question. Uh, uh, Trump's um, uh, relevance. You know, Harper Collins announced this week that they're going to to uh, uh, publish Ron DeSantis' book, "The Courage to Be." free, which will come out in February, obviously a sort of presidential book, a pre-presidential run. Uh, the question is, has always been, no matter who runs, um, how are they going to depart from what Trump did? He shifted the Republican Party from being a uh, an internationalist, a free trade, uh, you know, kind of uh, old, I call it the echo of the past. All you have to do is listen this week, as Paul Ryan said, what we should do is cut entitlements, Social Security and Medicare, to realize the old guard in the Republican Republican Party still wants to come back and do things like that and say things like that. So Trump, whether it's Trump the nominee or not, Trumpism is here 100 percent. And I disagree with my colleague. There hasn't been a president in office who succeeded in terms of taking on China, uh, growing the economy, deregulating. We haven't had anybody since Reagan. And Reagan even wasn't quite as good as Trump was. He did a lot of other stuff that got a lot of negative attention, especially at the end. Did but, you say, uh, did you say uh, Reagan was not quite as good? As Trump? I don't think I don't think Reagan was quite as good at deregulating. That was the I was tying it to that comment. He had he had grand visions and he ended up uh, having to uh, deal with a lot of a Democrat Congress and had to couldn't get as many things done as Trump did during his time. Let me let me just uh, wrap this segment with this. Um, Sam, why did Biden move so quickly to stop the rail strike? And why was this so important to the supply chain. Well, I think he moved so aggressively on this because he, despite the fact that he continues to tell us that we're not in a recession and the economy's fine and his policies are just kicking in, he knows that that is absolutely not true and we're standing on the precipice economically. And if if this if there's a rail strike, it's a disaster for him politically. I find it incredibly ironic that the guy who heads a party that claims to be the party of the working man somehow still uh, can't hurry fast enough to Congress to side with giant corporations and crush a strike by, by striking workers. I think that's demonstrative of a lot of things. Well, Sam, it's always a pleasure having you on. How can we read more of you in and Magazine? And that's A&D. AndMagazine.substack.com. We are now at Substack. And Magazine, Substack.com. That means we have cut free of Google, amongst other things, in many ways. So. And Ed, how do we follow more of your broadcasts and your writings? Well, phyllisschlafly.com is the, or, uh, our organization site, and I'm uh, pretty active on Twitter, at Eagle Ed Martin, as well as uh, proamericareport.com, all those places. But uh, I'm most uh, uh, proud of our phyllisschlafly.com efforts. A lot of content there for people to, to see and, and, and uh, check out. And Josh, you? Uh, I write and speak for uh, different media outlets and organizations, but you can follow my work on Twitter at Joshua B. Shin. When we come back... Uh... Much more on this edition of the Armstrong Williams Show. Thank you all. Thank you, Josh. John Ricolta Jr. is the former United States ambassador to the United Arab Emirates, and he joins us today. Thank you so much for joining us, Ambassador. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, Armstrong. It's a great day in Detroit, and I'm sure likewise in Washington. Why is it such a sense of urgency, the transformation of the audio industry um, to electric? What is at stake? Well, I think uh, our government, the current government we have right now, is um, putting mandates in there to... Uh, uh, be all electric by uh, 2035. If you take a look at California law they just passed, uh, they basically have said no automaker can sell internal combustion engines past uh, 2035. 
I also think there's a realization that uh, oil uh, is on its way out and uh, this transformation will take a long time and a tremendous amount of capital. And that uh, capital is being spent right now and it's mostly government money with all of these incentives uh, that the Inflation Reduction Act and the SHIP Act, Act have provided. Uh, these manufacturers are all taking advantage of it and the uh, industry's on fire right now. How important, because you're in the state of Michigan, explain the real significance of Biden's CHIP Act that was passed. So both the CHIP Act and the Inflation Reduction Act gives uh, huge tax credits uh, to battery manufacturers and to companies that assemble or supply electric vehicles, uh, these amount to the billions of dollars and uh, these tax credits are good for as much as five years. Uh, they are um, are being applied for right now. And in addition to that, the Department of Energy has through um, uh, various legislation in Washington have passed out grants, you know, for the industry that so far have totaled about $3 billion and I understand there's about six or seven left to go. So when you put this kind of money on the table and you combine that with the experience that this industry has suffered uh, through COVID uh, and the lack of chips that go in a the car, there's, there's reports that as many as uh, 1,800 various chips go into the newest of vehicles today and uh, they couldn't get them and therefore it uh, suppressed sales. And so they're trying to onshore as much as they possibly can. So you add all these factors together, plus all the push toward climate change and the agenda that the current administration have, you have a very fast slope and uh, it is going at breakneck speed. You know, on Thursday night, I was honored to be a part of the 51st uh, anniversary of the founding of the UAE. Uh, which was hosted by Ambassador Yousef Ataiba. You were the ambassador um, from the United States to the UAE. Talk about the remarkable progress with the UAE and the importance of that relationship uh, here in the United States. Well, well, let's start. It's a young country, 50 years old. Uh, it's a moderate uh, Muslim country and have made a tremendous amount of progress in the last 15 years uh, toward what I would call their march toward modernity. Uh, they've done a number of things to open up their society. Uh, the construct of the UAE is uh, much different than almost any country in the world. It's about 10 million people. About a million of them are Emiratis and about 9 million are guest workers. And they know uh, that those guest workers are needed uh, for the future uh, goodness of their country. and. Uh, heretofore, they have relied quite heavily on oil, a tourism industry. Uh, they have one of the greatest airlines in the world, but they know that they need to uh, transform their economy to a knowledge-based economy. And they've done many, many things uh, to effectuate that. Uh, and um, and uh, I served there for just a little less than two years. Uh, they're moderate. Uh, they're great allies of the United States. They supported us in Afghanistan. They support us in the Middle East. Uh, they've committed their blood uh, to the support of the United States and the values that we hold. Uh, they are marching toward what they were referred to as a little D of democracy. And so I found uh, the experience uh, quite fascinating. And the uh, United States needs them uh, to moderate uh, the entire Middle East. And uh, they're a bulwark also against uh, Iran. And the bellicose nature of that country and and the uh, exporting of uh, you know their ideology around uh, the Middle East um, currently. You know, in your beloved Detroit, you've been such an advocate for the coalition of improving education in the school systems, not only in Detroit but throughout of the state. Where do you think the greatest progress needs to be made? And because it's not just in Bo Detroit where the situation is crippling, it's, it's pervasive all across these United States. Yeah, I, I think that our uh, primary and secondary education problems are, are massive today, and uh, they, they start in, uh, with the family and with uh, early childhood development. 
If you look at my grandkids today, uh, they have every opportunity at two or three years old to, uh, you know, learn from iPads and summer camp and all kind of of opportunities and uh, begin school in K minus three, pre-K three, pre-K two. And so uh, we've got to adjust our education system uh, to do several things. Number one, uh, we need to have uh, children start much earlier. Uh, reading is such an important part of uh, a child's education today. Uh, the, uh, the family is so important in terms of uh, appreciating uh, learning and learning became a lifelong application now it starts almost at birth and it goes right through death our world and the amount of knowledge that is doubling every uh, 12 to 18 months is enormous and that knowledge and uh, the ability to be able to appreciate all of that is very very important so is math stem uh, uh, access to these kind of programs adequate health care um, uh, extracurricular activities are all of all very important. Plus, I think, and from my perspective, the most important thing is uh, is testing and making sure that these kids, as they progress through their early grades, are keeping up uh, with uh, the amount of information and knowledge that they need to matriculate to the next grade. So when you put all of this together, uh, the inner cities, and that's the one that I'm mostly concerned about uh, most of all those things that I'm talking about, access to the internet, computers, um, good teachers, uh, robust safety in school, uh, lunch programs, all of this is important to highlight the need of, um, of a solid education today. And there was a very, very important study that was done by John Hopkins University uh, during the Obama years. And there were 11 million jobs created uh, during uh, that president's time frame, and all but a couple hundred thousand, you needed some kind of an advanced education past high school in order to secure that job. So the day of the unskilled worker is rapidly evaporating. And so all of this is needed by these kids today. You know, your um, company builds large manufacturing factories, and you've been doing so for over 100 years. How important and how do we get this country back to manufacturing? Well, um, number one, we need to create an infrastructure that uh, recognizes the value of those kind of jobs, these high technical jobs. You look at these factories today that we, we build, a big auto complex in the past used to have 8,000 workers in it. Today, it has probably half that number because of automation, uh, better production techniques, uh, robots, a number of things have reduced the number of man hours that are needed. Uh, but those robots and these conveyors and the sophisticated machinery need highly technical people uh, in, order to, uh, in order to operate them. And we have to have the talent in order to do that. Secondly, uh, if you take a look at where these plants are going today, they're going in states that have, have seen the future a long time ago and have created shovel-ready sites. Now, when we talk about the size of these sites, they are 1,000, 2,000, 4,000 acres of the ability to be able to immediately begin to build a plant, to have the infrastructure there, the proper zoning. Uh, it, it takes quite a while in many, many states uh, the governments have jumped into the fray in order for these sites to be available. You need low electric rates. Uh, and the United States is very, very fortunate and we you can be and should be self-sufficient in all forms of energy. Uh, you need a great talent pool. Uh, that talent pool uh, has to be educated and not only educated today, but you have to have a runway in place that you can continue to provide this kind of talent you know, for the foreseeable future, decades at a minimum. And the industry is changing so quickly, it's just not learning about what you have today, but staying on the cutting edge so that in the future, uh, you can make the necessary modifications to say competitive on a global scale. The Chinese are rapidly advancing in into the same industries as we are. So those are all the things this infrastructure has to be worked on and it has to be worked on across the country. And each state is responsible, you know, for its uh, own well-being. And uh, some states are faring much better than others. Listen, it has been such an honor having you on, um, 
joining us today and thank you for your service and also for kids and what you do in terms of manufacturing and building and empowering people around the world. We look forward to having you on in the future. Well, I'm glad to be here today and uh, thank you for the opportunity. It's our pleasure. When we return, Dr. Laura Verdin Am will join us to talk about antiques appraisals, the History Channel, and so much more about art. Don't go away. Um, Hi, I'm Dr. Lori. Hi, Dr. Lori. Nice to see you. Here we go. We have, I believe it's King David playing a harp, maybe. <laughs> okay. The print itself is a color lithograph, and it comes from the Verb magazine, which was a magazine that commissioned Chagall in 56 to make this particular series just for that magazine to be published. There were many of them published in books that people would have and reproduced as well. This one's a little bit different from that, but Having said that, this one has some nice elements. You notice right here, this nice painterly nature of this purple in the beard. Notice, of course, the harp. He plays the harp to get rid of evil spirits for King Saul. And then you have, of course, um, another sort of element here in the red. Very painterly for a color lithograph. What I don't like is this. It's not signed in the plate. It's not pencil signed. It's cut, and we have no margins. So that was where we went with value. What do you think it's worth? Wholesale, 400 bucks. Okay. All right. Um, thanks for stopping by. Appreciate nice to see it. see you. Take care. Nice to meet you, Alan. Thank you. Sure. And we welcome the star of appraisals from the RAS to books, to art, to antiquity, to sculptures. The, um, the lady in the myth herself, Dr. Laura, it is such an honor to have Dr. Laura Verdant aim on our show today. What are some of the most exciting art and antique objects that you have appraised over the years? You know, I've had a long and happy career as an appraiser after one as a university professor and museum director. Um, George Washington's wallet always stands out in my mind. I had the good fortune of appraising George Washington's wallet. They called them pocketbooks then wow. in the late part of the 1700s. And uh, that was certainly a career highlight for me. Um, I've appraised uh, memorabilia that relates to, uh, of course, Abraham Lincoln, like his campaign buttons, and the writing desk from Poplar Forest that belonged to Thomas Jefferson. So not only political pieces, presidential pieces, but then pieces that are a little bit more, um, I've had a diverse career because I've seen many, many objects over time. Uh, objects like Renoir paintings, objects like uh, the moon boot that was on Apollo 13 but didn't get to the moon. Um, so unusual objects because I've had the good fortune to talk to America and hear their stories of art, antiques, and collectibles for a long time. So. Why should we collect art, antiques, collectibles? We should collect art because there are a couple of reasons. Art, antiques, collectibles, any object that relates to history, and I've said for many years, Art reflects society. If you want to learn about history, which should be seen not as battles and, and dates and, you know, the boring part of history. You know, my degrees are in history and art history. But if you think of history as the study of people, and these objects are the objects that people made in a certain time period or needed in a certain time period or reflected what was important to them in a certain time period, then what you have is a connection to those who came before. And you can learn a lot from the lessons of history. And I always say, if you can tell the, the kids about it, you know, if you can, you can illuminate history, not only in books, which are wonderful and important collectibles too, but in objects themselves. So I think it's extremely important. I mean, I'm biased, Armstrong. I mean, I love objects. <laughs> so I'm biased in terms of that. But yes, I, I think it's extremely important. I think it really can open a whole different world for children and adults. It can teach you about places you've never been. You know, I've been lucky. You've been lucky. We've we've traveled the world. We're fortunate in that. And, you know, I've been able to stand in front of, you know, Rembrandt's The Night Watch. And, you know, I've been to St. Petersburg. And I've been, you know, in, in the company of wonderful objects, not only in big museums, but also with private collectors. Um, and, and seeing the people who we should highlight, you know, uh, 
Dr. Martin Luther King, objects that relate to, of course, his life. Um, you know, so I really think it's very important. And as an appraiser, everybody asks me about value. But once I explain to them what the history is, then everybody can understand why the value is, you know, what it is. So, so if I'm in grandpa or granny's basement, what types of vintage items should you hold on to? Fine art, furniture, precious metals, including jewelry, are always my top three. So whenever I'm talking to anybody, whether I'm talking to uh, the top financial advisors at a Barron's conference about what's valuable, Dr. Lori, or if I'm talking to a museum group of school kids, what's valuable, Dr. Lori, fine art, that's paintings and sculpture, furniture, furniture has a lot to do with how we live, what we live with, and precious metals, including jewelry, if we understand what precious metals are like. And to understand the quality of an object it, through materials is where you're going to understand value. Um, and then, of course, great design, a Lalique bowl, maybe, you know, a maquette, for example, um, a maquette from the Irish Memorial National um, Sculpture Project. So different types of things that relate or a painting that says something about a particular society. Um, and it can be something as simple as a beanie baby. And people will say, a beanie baby, Dr. Lori, what are you talking about? Well, beanie babies reminded us that in the turbulent 1990s, children wanted simple stuffed animal toys that were brightly colored and happy. And that's something that was different from what we were experiencing in a tumultuous time at the end of the American century. So on the, so on the business side of things, what types okay. of art, antiques, or collectibles should we buy now for the greatest return on investment for the future? I've told people for many years to collect what's coming. And what that means is all art and antiques relate to particular cycles, patterns of collecting. What will be valuable usually is something 50 years old or 100 years old, or any time an object is going to hit an anniversary time. Here's an example. We are coming up on an anniversary of our nation. In 2026, we will experience an anniversary of, of course, the founding of the United States. Interestingly enough, what we find is that colonial revival objects or anything that has to do with colonial American objects will hold their value and will spike in 2026. So here at 2022-2023, what we should be doing is amassing objects that relate to anything that has to do with colonial America and hold them until 2026 when we're going to have the big anniversary and everything's on a spike. So what? people say, how do you know this? I study the patterns of history and I study the patterns of collecting. And you've been doing it for a very long time. What are the best ways we can preserve history? Very long through... time, but good, but good makeup, you know? <laughs> well, you have more than good makeup. You are prolific <laughs> and very thorough in what do you, what you do. How do we preserve history through collecting these objects? I think it's extremely important to collect them. I think it's extremely important to share them. Um, you know, if I put on my my museum cap, I would say it's always a good idea to share them publicly if you can, if that's through a book, if that's through loaning something to a library, a school, a museum, if that's or if that's just telling the story, no matter how you do it, telling the story. You know, scholarship drives the market. You know, scholarship drives the market. Anytime that you talk about an object or it's published in a certain way, that value will go up and also that awareness will go up. So, yeah, I always say tell the story to whomever you want, you know, share it with people. And so that's basically the best way. And finally, because I know you've got to get out of here. When do we need appraisals? What information should be included in an appraisal? And how do you know you get a legitimate appraisal? I always say compare them to someone like me. So if they don't have multiple degrees, if they don't have many years of experience, you know, question your appraiser. Your appraiser should be, you know, again, a reputable appraiser, but they should also have the academic and experience background that you need. What should be in an appraisal? An appraisal should, of course, focus on the history, the background of the pieces, make sure there's information about the date, make sure there's also comparable sales records where a similar piece has sold. I want to see a comp. So basically, you know, you have a painting like this, I want to see another one of the same size by the same artist and where a similar one has sold. If something's very, very rare, you can compare it to similar rarities. 
But um, it, it's an awful lot of fun to collect. It's an awful lot of fun to share it with those you love and with others. And uh, there's really nothing like having uh, a world around you that's full of art and antique. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Lori. It's my pleasure always to talk with you. Thank you for presenting a wonderful show always, Armstrong. Thank you. And you know, I must Take tell care. you um, before we close that attending the World Cup in Qatar as a part of the U.S. delegation to the United States was a wonderful honor. I, I cannot tell you how I continue to have that feeling. I'm rooting so hard for the United States to have the biggest upset and to win it all. I know that seems improbable, but anything <laughs> is possible when you're in America. Possible. Anything is possible for us Americans. I've never felt That's more patriotic, Dr. Laura, and you only crystallized that for me in talking about collecting our history and preserving it. Thank you and everyone so much for joining us today on this edition of the Armstrong Williams Show. We're out of here.